Hello, and welcome to our sustainable yard care class called Starting from Scratch, Tips for Designing a Healthy Landscape. My name is Kristen Covey, and I'm an educator for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division and host of this series. The Sustainable Yard Care series is brought to you by a partnership between our agency and the Snohomish Conservation District. The presenters today are Kari Kwas from the Snohomish Conservation District and Monica Vanderveeren from the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. For those who aren't familiar with the King County Wastewater Treatment Division, our primary job is to manage wastewater and stormwater systems to protect water quality, but we also provide educational opportunities and support to the communities we serve. The image in the top right corner is showing you a map of our service area. Our service area includes a large portion of Western King County and even a small area in Snohomish County which is why we formed a partnership with the Snohomish Conservation District. Historically, we've offered these classes in person, which is what this photo is showing you at the bottom, Monica presenting, um, but we've appreciated being able to reach a wider audience through this online format as a result of the pandemic. This is one class in a series of seven classes we're offering this winter. This is the only pre-recorded class we're doing. The remaining classes will be held live with an audience and will allow time for your questions. The box on the slide lists the upcoming classes you can either join live or view later online. They will all be recorded. The classes will be held on Saturdays from 10 to 11.30 a.m. beginning January 8th and ending on February 12th. Links to register for these free classes are listed in the description below this video. So let's get started with the class. I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful speakers, Kari Kwas and Monica Vanderveeren. Hi, I am Monica Vanderveeren, um, and I am tailgating behind Chris and Covey because I also work at King County Wastewater Treatment Division. I do public involvement for large sewer construction projects, but that's not why I'm here today. We're gonna to talk about natural yard care. Um, and I have a lot of experience outside of work that I bring to the table um, to kind of help with this. I also have is an individual and in our district, we've partnered with the Snohomish Conservation District. Um, so I am really, you'll hear me talk about wildlife all the time when I talk about landscape, that's my focus at home. I have gotten certification as a native plant steward and a watershed keeper. Um, and I do a lot of volunteering. I do presentations, I've done online multimedia pieces, um, and I'm doing remote work now because we're during, in the middle of COVID. So the image at right is from an online piece that I've done to talk about what I've done on my property. And the aerial image you see of the green property by the river is my property. So um, I have a house, a barn, and some paddocks. So I can often relate to a lot of people in the audience who are on different types of properties. I have a house and yard and utilities I need to think about, but I also have a large acreage. I live in an environmentally sensitive area. So I'm really thrilled to be here today with Kari and um, I'm gonna turn it over to her to introduce herself and then to get us kicked off. Thanks, Monica. I um, On this slide, I have a whole bunch of different things going on, but part of it and part of why I'm here today, <clears throat> I work for the Snowmish Conservation District, but I'm a longtime fan of the Conservation District. And before I worked at the district, I had partaken in this little video called the Un on, what was it? Un Lawns to Lettuce Project. And so the top right picture is me with my metal tank in my front yard, more like a horse trough, if you will, filled with fresh compost. Look at that rich dirt <laughs> down below. You see the, ref the um, outcome of that, which was a ton of vegetables, way too much zucchini, um, but it was really fun to participate in that. And it was our start of the garden. Also then, because of the conservation district, I got into native plants. So the bottom left picture is me holding the blossoms from a mock orange, which smells so wonderful. Um, and at the top, you can see me and then some pictures of nature. And so I'm a photographer. So part of my joy of the garden, not only to eat what I produce, is also to take photos of it. So it's it's kind of like discovering what your joys are related to your gardening and how what 
what will make you happy. So my title of the district is Community Engagement Project Manager, which means that I work with a lot of cities on um, natural yard care, uh, adult and youth education, um, also fairs and all of these webinars. My goodness, we've done a lot of them over the last two years. And it's been fun to connect with an audience like Kristen said, so I'm glad to be here today. So just a little bit about what a conservation district is. Um, our conservation district happens to represent Snohomish County and Camano Island. Um, in 2021, we hit 80 years of service in Snohomish County and 60 years of service on Camano. And if you kind of think about the landscape, you recognize that Camano's hooked <laughs> as a kind of a land bridge there. So we work with urban audiences, rural audiences, and the land managers, whether you own or lease or what have you. But we're trying to help you improve your native your natural resources like soil health, water quality, air quality, planting trees, managing stormwater. Um, and in this case, this whole series is covering really growing your own food, um, working with the landscape you have, and kind of just going through a lot of our best practices, which we call BMPs. So please reach out to us. It's free technical assistance to you. We'll come out to your property and take a look at what you have going on and help you. So by all means, reach out. Um, and we do a lot of education like this. So we are a part of your native environment, there's 45 of us across the state. So no matter where you're tuning in from today or watching this, there's probably a conservation district representing you. So today's talk, um, I think the combination of Monica and I is, is going to be pretty good for you because she's got a lot of technical know-how <laughs> related to this and I have practical experience. But what we're offering you is an opportunity to think about your landscape. What do you have in front of you and sort of gets you on the right path? The rest of the series is really going to go into all the nitty gritty details. What are you, if you're interested in wildlife, you can do that or native plants or stormwater maintenance, all of that. But today we're just talking about things you should consider, ways to get started and move through the process of designing what your landscape around you will be like. So again, some of the things we'll be talking about today, what is your gardening style? And everybody's different. <laughs> um, mapping the lay of your land. You don't have to be a GIS expert. You can just get a napkin and draw something. Um, how much money do you have to do this? How much time? What are your resources? And then we want to set you up for success. So that way, whatever your vision is, you can follow through over the course of time. Yeah, I like this one. Very simple. We just want to put you on your path. <laughs> this is about you, not about us. I mean, I may be, may be talking about my garden today, but at the same time, um, realistically speaking, maybe you can take some ideas I have, some of the things that Monica is going to talk about. And between the two of our experiences and know-how, you can move yourself down the pathway of having what you would like around you. This is a very technical document and I, this is not how I function <laughs> with my garden. I'm very much an experimenter, but this is something that people can do for you. If you reached out to the conservation district, I can tell you that our engineers would draw some sort of engineering plan. Um, you can take a, a picture of Google earth and do something like that as well. You know, draw what you want to on it. You don't have to go so fancy. So I think the next slide will show you another example of something very simple. Um, again, we all kind of know what our property looks like. Um, so just get out a piece of paper and draw it. Um, maybe have your kids help. That could be fun too. You know, what is, if I'm looking down an aerial view of my property, what am I seeing? The house takes up so much space or the apartment. Maybe I have a pond in back. Maybe I have some trees already established, but draw them so you have a sense of where you are because you're the one that's gonna know your property the best. So it doesn't have to be fancy by any stretch. And now I would like to turn it back to Monica because she's gonna talk about knowing your style, uh, which is very important. Thank you, Kari. And uh, one of the important things to know, so Kari talked about making a simple, basic plan. Um, before we get started on this, this is the fun part. You get to sit here and think about you and what you want um, and who you are. So I'm going to walk through just some considerations that you'll have about you. Before you make this plan and start thinking about the future, you're going to want to take these into consideration. So your landscaping style, what style appeals to you is gonna be a really important thing to know. If you've never gardened before, there's a way to figure this out. So I'll tell you. The reason it's important is that 
if you don't like it, you're going to not want to be out in that yard. You're not going to want to use it and you're not going to want to take care of it. So for my style, this stone cottage at the right is exactly what I love. It's got this rough stone wall on the bottom. I know that rough stone wall is going to have frogs and garter snakes in it. It's got this profusion of textures and color in vegetation along the top. I really like this look, but you may not, right? So if you like simple, cleaner lines, the Japanese garden look, this to you may feel messy, uh, overwhelming, claustrophobic, right? While most of you, I'm guessing, don't have a French castle, like the picture at the left, it literally is a castle in France, I took the picture. You may want something that looks like this. What you should know is that if that's a more comfortable style for you where it's more formal, it still can be sustainable. You'll find out in this class and future classes that you can make any yard, no matter what your style is, sustainable. You'll want to know what your vision for the future is. What is it you like to do with your space? Are you going to plan to have a family? Do you have one now? Um, are your kids going to have grandkids and you want to make some child play space? Uh, are you getting pets? Um, do you need a catio for your cat? You'll want to think about that. In the lower left, there is a picture of an outdoor entertainment area. If you're going to make this really great yard space, maybe you want to carve out in that future plan a space to entertain friends and relatives. Um, so you'll want to think going forward, if your property is the one in the upper right, where it's a house, a simple vegetation around the house, and big expansive lawn, what do you want to do with that? And, and how do you need to use it? You can change things in the future. Kari and I will give you some tips on what to watch for so you, you don't accidentally make your life more difficult in the future. But you can change your mind at any given point and then move things around if you need to. A lot of people want to think about growing food in the future if you're not already doing it now. So you're gonna to wanna to carve out a space that makes sense for you to do that, to have enough space to be able to access it. There is truly nothing more marvelous and nothing more tasty than the tomato that you grew yourself that you are eating after you picked it off the plant. Um, and so if food is in your future, Again, the conservation district has, every conservation district has tons of resources on this. We'll have some more classes as well. Um, you can definitely work that into any landscape, whether it's a window box, a balcony, um, on a patio in pots or in the ground. But you're gonna wanna know if that's something that is gonna be in your future. Uh, do you want a wildlife sanctuary? As I said, I'm a wildlife nut. So in the upper left, you see cedar wax wings on a native Oregon grape favorite plant and bird combination. Hummingbirds on bee balm in the lower left. Um, another hummingbird, on, unfortunately a blackberry stem. Butterflies in the lower right is an owl. I get migrating short-eared owls. And in the uh, upper right is, I actually can't see it because it's over, it's a songbird. Um, but I have this incredible plethora of wildlife. So you'll want to think about that. If that's your goal, we'll have a class on landscaping for wildlife. There's a lot of resources out there. But again, you're going to need to think about that in the beginning. Would I like to have wildlife or not? Uh, human sanctuaries have become very important during the pandemic. We're all locked in at home and a touch of nature is really a welcome thing. So creating spaces for you to sit and enjoy, meditate, have tea, really important as you think about your plan. I personally made the mistake of not putting in seating areas in the beginning. I was busy doing all sorts of work. And finally, after about 10 years, I thought, I don't actually sit and enjoy my own space. And then I started looking around my yard for where can I create seating where I can enjoy something about the yard, where I can sit outside now and work and when the weather is nice. Um, you'll want to think about color. If you like having color in your yard, frankly, I love the Pacific Northwest. We're lush, we're moist, we're very green. In the wintertime, we have very short days. It's very gray and it's very overwhelmingly dark green. So I have thought about color is very important to me. And I really think about creating color all year long. It also helps wildlife but I am looking to introduce that. And that's something else you'll want to just jot down in your notes as you're thinking about what would I like if you want color. 
And last but not least um, is fragrance. A sensory experience in a yard is really important for me. Researchers have actually found that the memories you retain the strongest usually have to do with scent. Um, and they change over time as we become more urbanized. So it's the scent of uh, the first rain on pavement as opposed to the scent of the first cut of hay. Um, but I want to have seasonal fragrances in my yard. And so I have planned for that as well. So I'm going to turn it back to Kari. And what we're going to do, we've talked to you about getting that plan, you know, thing, knowing that you're going to have to have even a casual plan together. And then what do you want to be on that plan in the future? She's going to talk about what you need to know today to make that plan work for you. So here's my house. This is a boring picture of my house from probably about 15 plus years ago. And I think it was what was on the property um, uh, through the Scopey. We'll talk about that in a second. But very simple. We, If you look at it, you can see it's a triangle on a square. So when I think about my youth and drawing, what does home look like? Well, yeah, a triangle on a square. Front yard was always grass. Um, and then my parents had put in established um, plants, most native around the perimeter of the house. Um, when I look at this picture, I see a giant, and I think maybe Kristen can um, uh, put the thing by the front door. There's like the little um, air, yes, that huge, that's a little boxwood thing, massive. Couldn't see to the left and it, that's my driveway. So thinking about safety, that wasn't ideal. Um, all the other, there's some roadies there. There's um, some azaleas and japonica. And on the far right of the house, you can see like there's some sprigs coming up over the side. That was another huge plant um, that needed to be trimmed way back. But it was just kind of boring and it didn't offer much excitement at all. And when I moved back into the house in 2013, most of these were even more overgrown. It'd been a rental for a period of time. And so it was very overwhelming. <laughs> so when we talk about then moving to the next slide, um, we had wanted to do a rain garden in our front yard. And because we got excited about helping with stormwater. Well, I live on a bluff. Um, and so the pictures that you're seeing here um, great um, blue heron, beautiful bird. They fly over the Everett waterfront. And to the right of it is a picture of a maple tree that I have on the bluff. So it goes down the slope. We're about 100 feet up above the railroad tracks. It's very important what I do in my backyard because it affects <laughs> what goes over that hillside. And maybe you live on a hillside too. Also, some people will have um, places where they have creeks running through their property or native growth protection areas, and all of that matters. Um, so there's different rules related to the things you're able to do um, and not do. Um, tree protection ordinances, uh, ordinances, sometimes you can take them out. Sometimes you need to call somebody before you dare thinking about taking out a tree. So it's really important to pay attention to where you live, what your city rules are, if you're an unincorporated Snohomish County, what you might have as rules there. The other one that's on this list as well is homeowners associations. And they too have very specific um, covenants related to how they want their area to look. And so make sure to check in with those groups when you're thinking about what to do on your property too. So a couple ways that you can actually figure out who <laughs> you are tied to, because um, I can tell you that the government knows who you're paying taxes to and rates and all of these different things. If you live in King County, you can go to their website, the King County IMAP. If you're in Snohomish County, you can go to the assessor's website or SCOPY, they like to call it. Um, and either one is going to give you, you know, which plat you're in, how much land you have, um, what your acreage is and who you're paying taxes to. And so that way you can find out who, actually really who are your resources because with what you're paying, you're gonna get something back. Um, that's how it works with the conservation district. So you can look up um, either your property on either of these sites. And at the end I should, and we may have mentioned, but we will have a big list of resources. So all these links that we're putting in here, you don't have to be scribbling them down right now. Um, you'll have those at the end. This I thought was kind of fun because in a project we did, we took an aerial view, which is the right-hand photo of this picture. And you can see my house in the center there and you can see the solar panels. We went that way. The front yard, so towards the bottom of the slide is our front yard. And the lighter brown, you can see those are the pathways that run through our garden. Um, 
when you're looking at it in June, you can't really see the pathways. Everything is, you know, about six feet tall. But in the wintertime, like right now, everything's down and dormant. The pathways are very helpful for getting around. I My po property is very narrow um, and skinny. So to the left in that image is my driveway, which I share with my neighbor, <laughs> um, which is kind of an unusual thing, but it's an easement. There's a garage in back that we split. And you can see a second silver car in the top part of the um, property, which would be to the east side or the west side. And if I had a septic tank, maybe I would have left it as grass. We don't like to mow at our house. And so we've turned that into raised beds and I have some photos, but then also I have the slope. I also know and should know that on the right hand side of that picture, I share the property line with my neighbor and I'm my property line is one foot off of my house. So in that backyard I have, you can see it's a dark brown, that's their garden bed, not mine, but that's where that line is. So it's, it's important to pay attention to where your utilities are, where your water is, where the property lines are, know what's there, whatever I do does affect my neighbor. Um, if I was to put up a really big hedge right in front of their garden bed, it wouldn't get sunshine. So you have to be thinking not only what do you have, but then what's around you to think about um, how it might affect your neighbors. Yeah, so looking at your neighbors. I would love for everybody on my block, I'll be honest, to look like my garden when we get there and you can see what it looks like today. Um, because I'm more like this top picture in this photo where there's different layers and different colors and different plants happening in front. It's not grass anymore. It's way more interesting. And as Monica shared in that slide earlier with the birds, we do have a lot of birds. We have a lot of wildlife because we've, we've presented food options for them um, with our gardening. So make sure that when you're thinking about your own stuff, you want to fit in with what everybody's sort of doing. But also make sure you're talking to your neighbors. If you're planning on doing something very different, um, see if it fits in with their schema as well as how they have their property and make sure you know where those lines are, especially when you're dealing with water um, or any kind of hard structure that we're going to talk about in a bit. Ah, utilities. I'll start this one by explaining that um, I had a home rewire done this summer. So I had everybody from PUD at my house. <laughs> and what they were doing on this picture is um, bridling the power line from my, across my neighbor's property to straight on to ours. And you can see definitely in this photograph that there's plants beneath it, but none of the plants that are there in that edge part where the line comes to the house are ever gonna grow tall enough to interfere with that power line. Um, they didn't seem concerned about the roadie, which I found interesting because um, it's right next to the house, but we took out one branch. So it's it has a bit more freedom. But it's really important to pay attention to where the utilities are, especially for digging, but also you got to look up. So remember to look at both directions. So I'm going to, but I'm going to pass this to our utility person, Monica, now. Thank you, Kari. Um, I am really grateful that Kari's here telling her story. What happens in person when we do these classes, which is really lovely, is people share their stories and everybody learns from everybody else. Um, and so it's wonderful to have Kari both with her expertise from the conservation district and her story so she can show you, you know, it's really helpful to see these things on the ground. So um, utilities, I am terrified of electricity. I am just going to say that. Um, but the good news is there's a lot of resources to help you. Um, so first of all, in thinking about plant selections, every utility is going to try to help you not make mistakes. So they have resources online. Everything's online somewhere. Um, so this is an example from the Snohomish Public Utility District. So they have a native plant guide for planting under power lines. They have a tree book. Um, jurisdictions will have, you know, a tree list. Seattle has an approved tree list, and there's an amazing variety of trees on that list, anywhere you're near a right of way or a power line. So you'll find all sorts of resources. So you, even if you're like me and you're terrified of electricity, you don't have to be terrified of dealing with the utility and planning for it. Next. The one thing you'll want to do, so your overhead utilities, obvious where they're at. Um, some places have undergrounded electricity. I actually have an undergrounded line between my house and my barn. And I didn't know it was there until actually it got struck by lightning. It wasn't protected. Uh, the ground got struck by lightning and killed it. And it was a bit of an expensive repair. And that's how I found out where it was underground. Um, so you should know where your underground utilities are. 
Um, so your sewer, if you are on sewer, you might be a sewer one line. They call it a sewer one line for a sewer district. I'm on septic. So I'm going to the public health district to look for where my septic is, okay? Um, for you can do an 811 locate before you start digging. This is always recommended. Um, they'll come out and paint their different colors for water, sewer, electricity, and that, but they can paint down whatever has ever had a permit ever. Um, they'll put paint where it's at, and then you can actually take photos of where those paint lines were. Um, and then you have them for posterity. So you should always keep calling them back out, but at least you know where your utilities are underground. Um, I would, what's happening now in Snohomish County, highly recommend it. If you can add surface markers or surface access in the case of a septic tank, they're recommending that you put risers and lids. This is my yard. I just did this this summer. What happens is with sewer, especially, we didn't want to look at it. It was unpleasant. You know, we didn't want to talk about it. And then it, you had to dig it up every time you had to actually pump and inspect. So people just didn't do it. And so by having this easy maintenance, you can catch problems early, get it pumped more often. It just makes your whole life easier. And you can do that with almost any utility. You'll have clean outs for a side sewer, even if you're on a city sewer system. So you wanna see if you start to find utilities, how do you mark them at the surface and protect them? Um, the, in, this is Kari's picture in the lower left. Um, she and I both had homes and I had a barn that were not grounded. So if lightning strikes, it isn't transferred into the ground to dissipate. So when you have ground markers, you wanna also know where those are at, right? So make sure that you've got those things marked out so you don't suddenly dig through your ground wires if they're buried. So you will find your utility maps online, as I said, um, they may be with different agencies. So the one on the left, they can be very casual maps. We were saying uh, you don't have to have fancy maps. They don't even have a fancy map for my septic. Um, it was literally a hand-drawn map. Um, there's a more official looking one on the right, but you'll find a lot of information online that will really help you. Um, I know for sewer in the city of Seattle and in King County, you can actually look up repairs when things have been moved. They keep the records, everything there is online. It really helps you to understand the place you're living and any future maintenance you have, may have to do on your own utilities. And so landscaping around utilities, Kari's obviously done a great job uh, by her overhead power lines. You'll also wanna think a little differently about it um, with your underground. Um, just because you have a tall tree doesn't necessarily mean the roots are a problem, but it can. So the bottom picture is an old clay pipe, which is really common in our area, especially in older homes. So if you have a newer home, it's gonna be less of an issue, but old clay pipes are really porous and they tend to crack. And, you know, roots are looking for water and food and what's coming out of your drain pipes, water and food. So what you are seeing in the lower picture is literally roots completely filling a clay pipe and they break it. And then when you usually find out this happens is when your sewer backs up into your house. Um, so you'll want to be careful. The upper picture is a tree root wrapped around a sewer pipe and cracking it. So what you're going to want to do is be aware of where those things are underground and choose plants that can live near them. So in our native plants, we have a big leaf maple tree and a vine maple, sort of a shrubber tree. The vine maple is fine in your backyard. It is small, it doesn't drop giant limbs, and its roots aren't looking for every drain, you, drain pipe you have or every water pipe, because your water pipes are at risk too. The big leaf maple, it's got these huge limbs, it gets ginormous, parts can chunk, fall off. That's Kari's maple on the slope, which fortunately is below her. But underground, what's happening with that is that those roots are seeking out water and nutrients and they will find your pipe. So you'll want to go into those plant lists, lots of resources online to really help you. I put Snohomish County Septic System Care and it's got a plant list associated with it and plant tips. Um, so these are some things you're gonna wanna think about when you find out what utilities you have and where they are is landscaping in a way that makes it easy for your your pipes to stay intact. 
The thing you'll want to do is also plan for future work in the area. If things get old, they need to be replaced. You may want to have plants over something that you can transplant, but you may not want to put an expensive Italian marble path over a pipe. I have seen this happen. I have seen whole houses built over pipes and then it becomes very difficult to do anything to protect that pipe. You almost have to reroute the whole thing, which is quite expensive. Um, so you're gonna wanna have those mapped out on your little really informal map. You can collect all the maps that are available on the web and then just kind of landscape around them. Um, so the other thing you wanna think about are if you are on rights of way. So that can either be a street, you might have a sidewalk and a planter strip. It might be the alley behind your house. And sometimes there's a green strip there. Some cities require homeowners to take care of the planter strips. Um, they are commonly referred to as hell strips because they tend to be like compacted dirt and weeds. They don't have to be. This right picture is a home with a really lovely entrance and it's got the planter strip in these, I think they're salvias, I probably got it wrong, um, but it's got like purple flowering plants and they're complemented by other yellow plants really lovely around along the sidewalk. And this works really well because as you see, the sidewalk's clear. You don't have things hanging over the sidewalk. You don't have leaves dropping, right? So super attractive curb appeal um, and the pedestrians can still get by. And these can be actually great places for wildlife. They're often quite sunny. So some cool sunny plants that might not grow in your shady backyard can grow in your planter strip. If you're on a street, you're going to want to think about sight lines. We have somebody near us that planted a hedge, and the hedge really was blocking a sight line where there was no traffic control. So the risk was really, if I was driving straight across the road, that somebody was going to come ripping around the corner and not see me and wipe me out. So um, you'll want to check if, you're, if you have this situation where you are on a road, and especially a busy arterial, before you plant that planter strip, just again, check on your city's website, um, get some technical assistance if you need it to kind of figure out where to go, but just find out what you are supposed to or not supposed to do. And then as you think about planting, think about not blocking sight lines for cars. So the thing you should know about landscaping in the right of way, you can do it. I would not hardscape. That's usually requires a permit for most cities. So don't think about, we have had seen this with gazebos in the right of way. Not a good idea. Uh, it does require a permit. Sometimes irrigation and ornate fencing can require a permit. So you'll want to know, as Kari said, where that property boundary is. Um, and then know that anything in the right of way can be removed. And here's why. The right, it's, it used to be referred to as the public right of way. It might be utility right of way. There may be a future project that says, hey, I have to build there. The images that you're looking at here in the upper left is like a, an excavator. Um, you've got some heavy equipment and like this nice flowering yard, what just happened here. In the lower left, what you'll see is my colleague Erica's house. So she and her partner are um, gardeners and have the most amazing yard. And they were doing these beautiful plantings, floral plantings in the right of way. Well, the city came and decided to put in bioswales to take water off of the street and filter it and clean it before it gets to Puget Sound. Great idea. And she was all for it. And she worked with them to remove her so she could transplant her plants out of the right of way before they came with all this heavy equipment. You see the workers among her flowers. Um, she got all the plants that she could get moved out of there left before they arrived. But do know that, that if you're in that right of way, that they, it can be used for other purposes. I'm going to turn it back to Kari, who's going to uh, start talking about other considerations for access and continue her story about her property. Yes, yeah. It's important to know how to get in and out of a yard <laughs> and your space. And, you know, I have the mail people that walk through delivering the mail and we're happy if they walk through our garden, but we want to make sure they can get through the pathway safely. Um, a lot of it, uh, just safe travel. Also pet use. Um, I see, I think that's Monica's dog in this photograph um, <laughs> or on this slide. 
Uh, we have cats, so they really like our garden because there's enough little hiding spots for them and they can be safe too. If you have kids, you wanna be um, thinking about play areas or where you might wanna sit, like Monica described earlier, if you didn't plan for that, now where would be big enough to have a chair? I certainly live on a walking street, so it's nice when you can actually provide a little bench for neighbors who wanna sit down and take a little break when they're walking along. Um, garbage and recycling. So in the next slide, um, go ahead and move to that. I think this I have, yeah, the very large one here. This is my front yard again, and you can see the yard waste bin right at the, the edge, the curb of the street. Um, and we put in a little concrete pad, not a pad, but um, just the hard rocks. So water can infiltrate, but at least it's hardscaped enough that we know that's where our recycle bin goes, or if we had a delivery of some sort, there's some place to put it, because I wouldn't want them to cover up my blueberries, for example. <laughs> so thinking about that kind of access as well. In the backyard, we again, we took out the grass, we're still working on that, but we have the raised beds and something to consider is always, is there enough room for me to walk through? Is there enough room for my neighbor who on the side, if you remember, there was that garden bed, um, can run the mower through because technically that's their property. So is it wide enough? So thinking about those access points, maybe you use a wheelchair, you want to make sure you can fit through your garden space if you set up beds um, or a stroller or or a bicycle yourself, however it is. So thinking about um, being able to move through. Everything on this slide, again, is permeable, which means that water will infiltrate. <laughs> and that's important because we don't want it to pool. I have other places where it is just concrete and it will pool. But if all of your landscape was hardscaped, like the driveway, um, that can just set up problems with flooding and other access, things like that. So you wanna make sure that there's a way for that storm water and storm water is rainwater that falls heavily, picks up what it catches on that cement and then rolls either into the storm drain. And what people may or may not know is that when it hits, you know, the little gutter that goes down the street, that doesn't go into a, filter, a filtering system. It just goes straight out to the sea. Um, so what we do on land matters very much to what happens at the street level. So I know when rain hits my garden, it's more like that forest and it goes straight down. But if it hits the concrete, it rolls off. Um, so we wanna try and mitigate that as much as possible. So I think the next slide um, goes into some a little bit of pathways and hardscaping, but you'll notice on all of these, that there's kind of a balance, you know? Um, maybe on that, let's see, top left is my backyard again. There's my cat, um, Gatita, and we have a mixture. In fact, this looks messy, but it's because it's not done. But, you know, we have some slate, we have some old um, like pebble tiles that were there. We use those as edging, we use them as stepping stones. So that way you can step into a bed actually and do some weeding without destroying your plants. Um, the upper right shows kind of a, or a stone edge grass with a um, spigot for a water like watering system, but then also some pebbles. So maybe that's your pathway that you're walking on, leaving your grass alone. That works great too, because water can get down. The ones on the bottom are both kind of um, tiled pathways. I tried to do this once at another house. It's a lot of work because you need to get it level and you need to have all the layers underneath from gravel and, and flattening and everything. And I decided I don't need to do that. We're good with chips. <laughs> so, and again, in that upper left picture, you see cedar chips, which are easy to get from a lot of the suppliers around the area, but they provide a nice way for you to be not on your plants. It keeps weeds down um, and the water can infiltrate. So having a balance of a hardscape and then um, a softscape so it can go down is really nice. Um, considerations for plant growth. This is important. Um, think about it when you go to our plant sale, for example, everything is bare root. They're tiny. <laughs> um, sometimes they look like sticks, um, but that does not mean they're going to stay that way. Um, I show in this upper left-hand picture, a picture of a heather, which is in our front yard. I planted it at the base of the roadie. That came in like a four inch pot. That thing is now about two, three feet across. And if I let it, it will just sort of keep expanding out. And I put it in a place where it can do that. And it's great, but maybe you don't want to heather that big. Um, in the right upper right hand, you have some, I think those are Norfolk pines. Um, and over time, maybe this is a little lopsided that perhaps you don't want those in the front row because they're going to block the stuff and back. 
or maybe they're too close together. And so making sure you have enough room for the plant to grow and expand because they do that here. We live in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> it's, it's got the perfect amount of water most of the time um, to do that. Down below, again, little cat cubbies, um, but there's a lot going on in this picture. Um, the peonies, they grow and expand. Um, ferns will grow and expand. Mint, oregano, um, trying to think if that's delphinium. There's a lot of different things that will take up more room if you let it. Um, so just being able to leave some dirt, leave some brown space showing, so that way the plant has a place to go. Um, and make sure you pay attention to those little tags that come on plants so you know what the conditions are for it as well as how much space it will take up over time. You see this a lot in cities where they plant a tree and they give it like a little basin at the bottom part. But what is happening in this image? You can see that the bricks are raising up in different places. Well, of course, that's the root system. And so paying attention to where you're putting your hardscape, especially, yeah, I know, again, the timing it takes to do this type of work and the effort and money, you don't wanna put a tree here, perhaps. You would wanna put it in a dirt bed or somewhere else where it has an opportunity to do its thing and, and set it up right. I was thinking about, there's some pictures, I think further down, both Monica and I do photography. And when you are taking a photograph, you wanna set up the, the how it looks as best you can in the camera, you know, as you're taking the picture, not trying to edit it later. So look around and see what will work. Again, coming down to the size of these things and um, find different ways to set yourself up for success on that front. Oh yeah, so mapping planting conditions. So this is the experimental fun part of gardening is that the tag may say one thing and um, your garden you know, changes throughout the day. So again, that image on the left is the one I showed before. So here's my skinny property. I know again, and I put in a little wheel is that east is behind me, west is out towards the water. And in the morning, I get a ton of sun. Comes over the hill, my front yard gets a whole bunch midday, depending on the time of year, it's kind of right over the top of the house and then it drops to the back. Long summer days, northwest, it's, it's hitting my garden quite well because the garage sits to the south. So I know that I can actually have a lot of food in the back because it will get plenty of sun, maybe sometimes too much. But for your particular property, do you have a lot of shade? Do you have a lot of big established trees? If so, you may not want to put your garden bed right next to it because if you're growing tomatoes, they need more light. Um, or maybe that tree is taking up so much of the moisture that your plants around it aren't gonna get supported the way they need to. So part of your map and the way that you draw stuff is to think about and pay attention for a while. Just go stand at your garden eight in the morning. How much sun is there? Or is it still shady? What about the evening and afternoon time? How much sun is it gonna get? Or again, if there's structures nearby, um, is it gonna get the water down where it needs to? Um, one of my colleagues at the district was talking about her food forest this summer and how those layers of plants actually benefited her plants overall because there was more moisture in the ground. So the shade was helpful, if you will, um, as opposed to having it being flat, open, there's no protection at all. So realistically, when the sun hit the ground, it was so dry, it was so drought conditioned. Um, so paying attention to those factors as well. So layers can actually really help you have a successful garden. Some of the plants that are on here, the upper right hydrangea, um, oh, that's a blueberry, I believe. And then at the bottom, a fern and that cute little daisy type thing. So there's a mix of plants you can do because of the conditions. So again, paying attention to your property, what it looks like at different times during the day, and then adding in layers and plants that will work. Oh yeah, this one's Monica, the rhododendron okay. house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I am back. So here's where we're at now. You have gotten your kind of vision of what you want to do in the future. And Kai's talked to you about mapping it out and making sure that you've got access and you've got drainage. So we're starting to develop this picture of our plan developing over time. Um, now I'm going to talk to you about how to keep your home safe, your structure safe. Um, and everybody wants it. So we've been through a lot of wind storms this winter. Um, this, the picture on the left of the top of a tree on somebody's house actually was on a windstorm in my neighborhood 
a few years ago. Um, so I know you're going to be a little concerned about that. And we're all looking at all of our trees going, I hope you're doing well because the wind's blowing. Um, and so it's really important to really look at your house and go, what do I have to do to keep it safe? It seems obvious that you don't want a tall tree, but maybe the tree's okay. Um, you don't want to immediately say all trees are bad. As Kari talked about, and this has been very true on my property, trees are really important for thermal regulation. That's the techie term, but it's keeping your house cool, keeping moisture in your lawn. Um, they also can help your house stay warmer in the winter. If you've got a cold wind howling across that house, and you can lift a lot of heat from a house. So you're going to want to think about keeping the house safe, but not necessarily just turning everything into gravel. Um, that's not necessarily going to help you. Um, the picture on the right is somebody who let a rhododendron go completely wild and take over their house. When you get into this setting, one of the basics on keeping your house safe is don't have everything growing on the foundation. Um, this is not safe for your house and don't have a lot of branches touching, a, you know, like this roadie, your roof, your siding, your windows. First of all, it's going to be really hard to maintain anything, right? Because you're fighting all these branches. The other thing that can happen is all plants have insects. That's good. Birds love insects and they really depend on those insects in your plants. Uh, if they're all the trees are touching your house, the insects can walk in. So can rodents, squirrels, rats, right? We have tree rats in Western Washington. So looking at your house as you're looking at your future plan and saying, does it have enough breathing space? Are there things touching it? Is, are they shading it and they shouldn't? Are they too close, right? and giving it some space to just be a house. This can also help you because we're getting droughtier. Think about if there was a fire in my neighborhood, do I, would I have dry branches and vegetation touching my house? Would that make it hard for firefighters to protect my house if there's something happened in my neighborhood? So really something you wanna think about. So all of us who have, uh, Kari talked about some of her issues, we all have issues when we buy a property that somebody else planted, um, where we come in and we're like, and why did they put that there? So these are two pictures of trees growing close to the foundation. At this stage of growth, you're looking at going, why would anybody do anything like that? Well, they were teeny trees to start out with. And as Kari pointed out, people don't always look at teeny trees and realize they're going to be the giant tree. So if you've got things like this, um, our recommendation is if you inherited any kind of problem or created it yourself, I've done that myself, consider correcting what somebody else left you. And if you start to notice your stuff becoming a problem, correct it early. It's just cheaper. Um, everything gets more expensive. And then there is the possibility, you can see that tree on the left, there's a distinct possibility the roots may have harmed the foundation. So as you look at your plan, you're going to want to look at some early action items. Is there anything that really needs to go, right? Even if it's something you don't like, I have, uh, they planted a lot of junipers on my property. I have now decided I despise junipers, not native junipers. These are like the sprawly, bought it in the box store kind. They take up, I removed one that was taking up 400 square feet of space. I was like, it's a big green blob with itchy needles doing nothing but sheltering rabbits that are eating everything else. And this could be this wonderful array of color and different plants. So I just tore it out. So it wasn't even harming my house, but I just hated it. If I had thought about this when I bought the house, it was a teeny juniper. I didn't know enough to know it was gonna become a nightmare. So correct things early. If you've got problems, think about removing them before you start doing your dream landscape in your yard. So um, Kari mentioned this earlier, um, you want to have some, think about some things when you're gonna remove trees. Uh, this is actually a story from my house, which is in the lower picture. And there's a very tall weeping cedar and there is a man up in there who is a qualified contractor taking down limbs. I had to take down the tree. I hated this more than you can imagine. Um, you see the bird in the upper, it was a perching tree. So I could come out and there were always birds in that tree. It was the most amazing thing. And it gave me some shade on the house. Here was the problem I had. My prevailing wind comes from behind my house and the tree was pretty well buffered. The wind that broke the tree onto the house that I showed in that earlier picture, when it would hit this, the tree was trying to tip on the house. 
The reason was, is they planted the tree teeny and then paved around the front of it. So it could never grow roots on that side. So as long as the wind hit it from the opposite direction, it was fine. But from this direction, it had these stunted little roots and it was trying to tip over. The other thing it was doing, you can see how tall it is. It did give me a lot of shade, which was nice, but it was also shading the roof. And I was gonna have my roof replaced and it was really mossy in the front. And that's the only place it was really mossy. And I thought, it's just time to go. I planted a lot of other trees. I'm really pro trees. This one was just in the wrong place. Um, and so this is why we talk about just being thoughtful and having that plan and considering these things and having a good picture of what's in your yard because then you'll, you'll get yourself started on the right track early. If you do have to remove a tree, check if there's a tree protection ordinance. Um, as Kari mentioned this, some cities have it. I do not in rural Snohomish County. Um, mine also was not near a power line. I have a walnut that's too close to a power line. You have to, those need coordination between a contractor and your utility to make sure that they are taken down safely. And you wanna get qualified contractors. Um, if it's yours, you'll wanna make sure that you have qualified contractors. So you see how close this tree is to my house. I wanted them licensed, bonded and insured to make sure that the tree, if it ended up on my house, I had a way to be compensated and recover my loss. Um, I used my tree on site. I One of the things you can think about if you have to remove, um, can is there plant material you can keep on site and use for anything else? So people will remove trees and branches and things like that. Can you chip them to make a chip path like Kari's, right? If it's not a disease tree, you can keep the material on site. I use my logs in the landscape. So it's something you'll want to think about. If a tree is the problem plant you have to take out, do it the right way and think about how it might be part of your landscape into the future. We have a lot of resources in Puget Sound. As Kari said, we'll be putting resources in the description for this video. So you'll be able to just click on links. Um, and then we'll have links for the Snohomish Conservation District, tons of resources there, as well as uh, our it's King County Brightwater Center. Um, this is an image that shows you there were, there's a lot of helpful resources to help you to visualize the space you're in and think about windproofing and fireproofing. I can tell you, I work with the conservation district and I have layers of native trees behind my house. The wind velocity hitting my house is a lot lower. None of those trees have come down. I've had ornamental cherries come down. None of those trees have come down and they helped me do this plan so that I could get windproof my house, but have the trees themselves stay standing. Yeah, and then things to consider on maintenance too. I <laughs> take a look at that where I'm wearing the orange shirt and what I'm holding in my hand is a blackberry root. That's their root system. Um, they're nasty. Um, all behind me, it's it's a it's a exercise in futility sometimes. And every once in a while, you get something like this and go, yeah. I got you. Well, Himalayan blackberry is everywhere. Um, it was brought here because it was tasty, because um, it is, I call it a tasty weed, but it does need to be maintained. So depending on where you live, you need to be thinking about while you're establishing stuff, what may happen down the road in terms of time and effort and what you're willing to put in. Um, and so it, also the photographs here, um, the top right, you see a woman using a wheelchair, but she's able to garden because she has a raised bed that's raised up to the level of her chair. And down in the bottom picture, the same thing. Those are raised beds that can be really put anywhere. In this case, they look like they're on a hell strip. Um, so they're a community space, um, but they're up high. There's enough space in between them. And then it's nice because you can take the things off the top as opposed to having to crawl down on the ground to get the food out of the bed. So thinking about, are you going to be doing the work yourself? Is it, are you going to hire a landscaper to do that? Do you want to pay money to have someone do this work for you? Is it what you enjoy doing on a Saturday or Sunday? Um, and then what if life gets in the way? And realistically, that does happen. Um, gardens can be left alone for a while um, and that's okay. But at some point, they do need attention and, and they usually tell you, um, <laughs> you sort of walk out and go, oh, I can't walk on this pathway. Oh, wait, I'm getting caught by this blackberry thing. Oh, um, there's a lot of different things that happen that way. Or your neighbors will point out, you know, <laughs> 
that one plant, I can't see my view anymore. Oh, right. Okay. That's right. I'll do my work. So thinking about the maintenance as you're establishing your bed is very important. Tools is on there too. It does take some nice tools. I mean, you don't have to go crazy high end, but as you garden more, what I have found is that if this is what I'm doing in my fun and free time, I want to have the best tool possible <laughs> to make it as enjoyable and, you know, not cause repetitive injuries, you know, clipping and all that or digging and stuff. There's a lot of people that will give you ideas about what you can and should use while you're gardening too. So think about that. Oh, and yes, I've seen this too. Um, on the hell strip in Everett, the they put the tree in and when they first established the tree, and again, they had a list like Monica was talking about and what was allowed to be plant there, planted there because of the height and such and for visibility down the street. But they'll stake them usually at the beginning when they're getting established to make sure that it stays upright. You have maybe um, maintenance requirements of watering for a while until it's established. But in this case, sometimes you'll see plant tags or things looped around trees. And if you forget they're there, this photograph is showing how that cord can really sort of strangle the trunk of a tree, or maybe it's the branch or something, or you forget to take the price tag off the plant. Make sure and do that. Um, just sort of, again, pay attention. Sometimes it's nice when you have just planted a tree and you don't remember what it is, or like, which one did I buy? Which which species is this, but then do take it off because over time um, they do continue to grow as we continue to talk about. So, oh yeah. And back to Monica, she's gonna talk about some different um, ways you can design this stuff. Um, thank you, Kari. And I can say I have done exactly what Kari described as leave the plant tag on because I didn't want to remember what the tag was. And then I've had it twist into a stem or create problems. So um, really what you should know, everybody who does this, no matter how long they've done it, we all make mistakes. So don't feel like you're under a lot of stress. So you now are, you know, you've got this plan that's developing. You kind of know what you want to do. You're starting to plan for how am I going to maintain this over time. Um, and now let's just give you some simple design tips. So the, you know, you're back into kind of the fun zone of how do I do creative work to make my yard look really cool. Um, so one of the things to think about is getting beyond sort of the old, Kari showed the very simple lawn in front of her house before she started working on it. It's the flat green lawn, it's the shrubs right against the houses and no layers at all. And you'll have noticed looking at Kari, she's got a lot of different layers going. So garden space is really more than ground, right? Um, even elevating something slightly, this is a coworker's yard in the left. It's got a just short, not a true retaining wall, but just retaining wall blocks around a planter bed with herbs and then a grapevine coming down. And you see that looks really, it's a very, very small space, but it looks super rich. Um, in the upper right is an area I did in front of my front door. I removed the type of shrub that Kari had that was blocking the front door and the steps. And then I replanted shorter, smaller things in kind of a contained bed. There's a lot of different things you can do that where you're not just doing a square and planting in the ground or planting right along a strip on your house. Um, we've listed some of them here, pots and beds. And you've seen these in Kari's, present, Kari's home hanging planters, window boxes, islands, green walls, super popular, rockeries and trellises. I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly. Were you train apples onto a fence? Um, don't forget garden art and lighting and things that will make your garden really a joyful place for you and a place that you can celebrate even into the evenings when the light is low. And you'll want to um, think about getting creative with your space. Um, so the thing that we tend to do is go, oh, I'm going to plant, you, you saw Kari's original picture, I'm going to plant along this area, and this is the only area I can plant, it's a planter bed. You can plant anywhere. So I talked about removing a tree in front of my house and then using the materials for other things. The picture you see at the right is actually a teeny little garden that I planted in that plate in place of that tree this summer. So now I can sit on my front porch working and I have this wonderful flower array in front of me and bees and hummingbirds and butterflies. 
I used the wood somewhere else and made beds. I am trying to encroach on my lawn slowly, which you can do. We should always flag. You can do this bit by bit, which I'm doing because I'm in a big space. So I'm encroaching on my lawn. I made kind of a casual flower bed with the wood, but this is actually where that tree used to be. There is a balcony on the left that has plants all over. If you have teeny tiny spaces like this, they make great areas to have tiny places for wildlife and you and plants and just sitting and enjoying nature. So really kind of get outside of what might be this idea of having a postage stamp lawn. Uh, one of the things I'd recommend, uh, Pinterest for some reason or other is just full with, of great landscaping and gardening ideas. It's just chock full magazines, um, garden books at your local library, or just take a walk, join your conservation district or your garden club on a tour. A lot of people do garden tours and just kind of see what you like and get new ideas. This is what I do all the time. I steal other people's ideas and then implement them in my own yard. That popped up. That is a reuse. That was my last horse passed away. And um, unfortunately, this was his old trough, which you can tell he was chewing on. It's plastic. And it was definitely a chew toy. And in, in really memory of my horse, I put it in his paddock for a few years. I've now moved it. But it was really a nice flowering memorial. And uh, it really was his character because he liked to chew on his trough. So you can expand the sense of space, even if you're in a small space by curving things. So you saw, if you remember that French formal French castle in the beginning, even their flower beds and paths were curved. If you do everything in squares and rectangles and you can see all four corners, your brain has a marker of where the end of that space is. If you curve around a corner and the end of that curve is hidden, your brain thinks it goes much farther. So as you're coming into your yard, the one in the lower middle center is actually quite a small yard and there are structures all around there, other homes, and you see a little garden shed. Um, this is really a small space, but it's actually to your brain looks larger than it really is because the path curves. So think about doing curving lines throughout your landscape and it'll make the whole space look softer and larger and more actually mysterious. Layering also helps. Um, Kari's shown you a lot of examples of layering. Planting, either having low, medium and high plants like short, medium and tall, the plants themselves, or using um, pots and elevating the pots at a different level. So you might have small plants that are flowering, but the, the pots are elevated. What you always want to do is plant taller plants away from the view you care about. There is, if you've ever had an overgrown like um, rhododendron or something in front of your face, all of a sudden your yard looks about this big. They're teeny, teeny yards when you start to get tall things in front of you. So always have this sweep. It's like a, a wave rolling outward where the short stuff is in front of your view and the tall things are in the back. And I'm going to turn it back to Kari, who's going to walk through how she designed her yard. Mm -hmm. My husband laughed actually when I, he's like, did you write those words? Loose plan. I, I believe that to be true. Um, it is, uh, we had a vision sort of, you know, it wasn't um, so formalized and it certainly has changed over time. Um, but I think the time is on our side as well. Realistically, most of the work we've done has been since 2013 onward. And like I said, we had hoped to do a rain garden in the front. We had the paint markers where the utilities were and all that. And somebody said, do you have a basement? <laughs> and we said, yes, if you want water in it. No, um, water likes to go downhill. Um, so it changed how we could think about this space and we completely changed our vision. Um, and that's fine. Uh, you know, and even next year we could say, well, we want to do something else. So patience also plays in because things take time to grow. Again, little small plants do grow big, but you know, you have to wait a few years. And we certainly have put a lot of work in on a Saturday or Sunday when we're out front and we're digging and doing some weeding or planting something new. People walk by. Isn't that a lot of work? And we say, well, yes, but it's fun work and it's what we like to do. We're outside. Um, we're talking to neighbors walking by. 
It's work we enjoy. So it, that's very helpful <laughs> to think about too. Um, Monica was just talking about that sweeping look. Yeah, if you look at this, the hill strip has some shorter stuff. The blueberries are growing, which is fun. But then there's some maybe pieces that sort of go on those corners to kind of give it a sense of, well, here's the space. But yeah, the tall roadies at the back. <laughs> <laughs> so that way we can enjoy it. But it's not like somebody at the front, they can't see any of our other yard because all that's there is this big monstrosity in front. So I thought I would just walk you through some of the layers of the garden and I cannot cover them all, just come on by. Um, but we have native plants and a lot of them on the left here, you have a Western hemlock. And when we got it, it was probably... Well, I don't know, a couple feet. It's now much taller than I, and it's fun to watch. And it gets those little green, light green bits on the end as it's growing. And now you can see Christmas balls in there. We decorated, it's kind of our holiday tree. The one in the center is a sea thrift. These you see more on rocky shores, but we have a lot of rock wall area in our garden too. And they have a just lovely, they're like very tall stem. Um, and then that cute purple flower. And on the right is a nodding onion, which smells like an onion, but something to think about too, in terms of plant growth, when they drop seeds, they spread. <laughs> and if you have birds and wildlife, um, they eat it and they spread it. So I planted these, I kind of know where I planted them, but you start to see them in other places or suddenly the little three plants you put here is now 10 or 15. And so they do grow and expand, which is also a whole bunch of fun. Edibles. Um, I love to eat food out of my garden. It is really the best thing ever. <laughs> and in this slide, you have this, the coastal strawberry that I got from the plant sale. It takes over the whole hillside. There's actually a little spider on there too, if you look closely, but those spread and it's nice. It's not a weed. It's something you can go eat and they're ever bearing. So I can go out all throughout the summer and just go get a little berry. And it's like, oh, fabulous. Peas, we like peas. We do the little awning so that way has something to grow up on. Um, also can have sweet peas, so they have that smell. And this is just on the right, it's just one take. <laughs> you know, like one day you go out and I'm gonna get all the cherry tomatoes and then some peppers that are ready. And there's a cucumber back there. Like, fantastic. That's what we're eating this weekend. And if you have too many, you make sauce. Pollinator friendly, this one is also huge. Um, the one on the left is basically the sedum stone crop that usually, and it lately, I, I had not noticed until, oh, I don't know, the last two, three years, but they grow these beautiful flowers. <laughs> like they are ground cover, but then they extend and then they've got this gorgeous color and the bees love it. In the center there is a, um, it's a native wasp and I'm gonna like gold digger, I think is what it is. People got freaked out because of the very large things that were the murder hornets, right? I actually put out a little picture in my front yard to say, this is not a murder hornet. This is a native wasp. <laughs> they are good. They love these alliums because the alliums have the little flowers and I and daisies and everything. It's fascinating to watch the buzzing around and they don't bother me. They don't, they don't want to be bothered. They just do their thing. And on the right, you probably, that's either a honeybee or mason bee or something like that on a blackberry. They like them too. So but they're also, they need to eat and we need them so we can eat. So that's important. And then plants that make me happy. Um, the witch hazel is the one I'm holding, the yellow flowers. It kind of looks like a little spider. That's the tree that's in my front yard. And it's, it's a short tree. Um, so it's right on the hill strip, um, but it's kind of fun and cute. And it's a winter bloomer. I think that's important to think about too. Um, you know, Indian plum or osa berry is the very first native plant that blooms. Um, beautiful white flowers. It's nice to have flowers in the winter as it's raining at my window right now and the wind's blowing and it's dry. You need to have flowers and color. All the rest are going to be summer bloomers. So crocosmia, roses, um, a stargazer, lily. But it, think about things that you just like. Um, it doesn't have to all be native plants. That's not a big deal. Um, you can have all ornamentals if you want. This is your garden. It's your vision. What do you want it to be? Oh, getting started. And I believe we are back to Monica. One of the things we're, we're now, you've got a ton of information. You're going to like spend the rest of this really rainy winter doing some research and coming up with your vision and your plan. And you're going to be really thrilled to get started, but you're going to need to actually strategize how you're going to get started that works best for you. I think 
Kari and I have both emphasized you do not have to do everything at once, or you can. If you have the time, energy, resources to rip out your whole yard and start over and then put the thing in at once, great. But you may decide to go bit by bit. So next slide, Kristen, and we'll talk about that. So you have different options for preparing your space. You can just take a corner of your yard at once. I'm creeping in on my lawn. Um, I've gotten rid of portions of it now completely. But what I did is I crept in because I just didn't have the time and energy to do it all at once. So I'm like, and that also allowed me to make adjustments along the way, which was kind of nice for me. I was like, oh, I think I don't like that thing here and then move it or change my mind about how I wanted something to look. Um, as I said, I had to add seating areas. So you can start all at once um, or you can start slowly. What you see in the center is actually the Ballard Pea Patch and they have a variety of things they've done. So they've clearly cleared a whole space, probably used to have a building or something there. That's where that concrete pad is. Um, and so they put raised, you know, these galvanized um, tanks on top of that, but then they have beds and other spaces. So that's an example of where they probably just cleared out a whole site for the pea patch and started fresh, okay? And, and you can do that. Um, it's a big effort, as everybody knows, it's like deciding that you're gonna tear, gut your whole house to remodel it. Um, so that's a big endeavor and know that. And decide if you wanna do that or the creep up on stuff. Um, and then how do you want to get, if you're going to creep up on your lawn, how do you want to get creep up on it? So on the upper right, um, both in the lawn and out in my fields, what I've done is um, I start with, you just see the start of the layers and that's butcher block paper. I'll get any kind of cardboard you see on the lower left that looks like Kari's house, you know, using cardboard just to block out light um, from grass and from weeds, often they'll just die. You have to get the layers thick enough so they don't start growing through it. But sometimes you can just, in the winter time, the rain is your friend, pile up a pile of cardboard and the grass will be dead by spring, I guarantee you. Um, and you see on the lower right is a bed that I had killed the grass over the winter. So I'm creeping up on my lawn. And then I also put, I, when I had horses, I would put horse waste compost from my stalls, right? So then I would layer cardboard and horse waste. And then if you live in a housing, in like in a homeowners association or a very, very formal uh, community, one of the things you can do if you're doing a lot of mulching and composting is just put a really thin layer of decorative bark mulch over top. And I did this here. Um, so then you can't tell that you have this like really kind of informal mulching and killing the lawn beneath system, it, it actually looks a little more dignified and then you can plant. Um, you don't have to do it yourself. We've had people in these classes who are just gonna hire a contractor, but just really want to have the whole handle on the whole process themselves. And then they're gonna hire somebody else to do it, right? And it does help you to know what your vision is so that somebody's not dictating what your yard is to you. And then they leave and you're like, what did I just inherit? Um, and then I'm going to turn this back over to Kari to talk about soils, which we will be covering in a later, um, a later class, and then considerations for the plants you're going to put in. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they may not be um, sure about what they want to plant where, you know, and lots you're going to get in the little pots on the left. Um, and that looks like actually something that we would have after our plant sale when if something is bare root and it hasn't um, sold or we are going to use it on a later project, um, then we just pot them and you can set those anywhere. In some respects, it can be a test run. You can see if a, pot, a plant or a tree likes the light and conditions where it is before you put it in the ground. Um, and the soil is also very important. And regarding wherever you live within the county or this area, you're going to have different soil. And so on our website, we do have a little booklet um, called Know Your Soils, and it can get into the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium, I think, is the K, which is always weird because why is it K? Um, but those are the nutrients that help plants grow. And if you are short on one, maybe you add some fertilizer or amend your soil, but it's important to not just, oh, I need something, so I'm just going to dump <laughs> fertilizer on my garden. No. Mm -hmm. 
test it first um, to make sure that you actually are short or, you know, have a plan over um, time to amend your soil with compost. So we've used fish meal. It smells terrible, but it does work. Um, stuff from your garden. Maybe you want to have your own compost bin. A lot of people will do that. I just put it in the yard waste and I get it later <laughs> through the process, um, but they'll talk about that in the soil class coming up. Um, also, when you plant bare roots, we say over water. Well, you need to get them established. So one thing that on our website for the plant sale that's important is that you don't just stick the stick in the ground and call it good and walk away. No, <laughs> you got to soak those um, because usually by the time that you pick up plants from our plant sale, um, they've been in a bag. You know, we put them in with some kind of like a uh, wood sh shavings or something like that, and they're moist and they will stay that way. They're dormant. It's okay. But then you want to soak them and soak those roots for a little bit before you put them in the ground and then give them the water they need to get established. And that's why we also say to plant in the fall because the rain is doing it for you. <laughs> um, don't plant in July. You can just know that you need to then really, you need to own the maintenance of that plant. Otherwise it will not survive where you are. So Take a look at the different, the Know Your Soils booklet, and that'll be in the resources, and test your soil. Another thing to think about for soils is contaminants as well, and there are ways to do that, um, and that's something we also talk about in that booklet. Okay, so the steps to do a soil test. So what you're looking at here is probably a graphic that looks really small, but it's also in the booklet, so just ask for the booklet. Um, going through different eight steps of how you can do your soil sample. And one is just to figure out where on your property that you want to actually say have a bed. If you wanna, you don't have to do everything, but where do I wanna start planting something that I really want? Um, find those areas. Then you have some different supplies and on the little form, it'll tell you what those supplies are. Generally, it's a little plastic bag you can put your soil into, um, a little bucket to keep it along the way, a shovel, and then your, something to write the date on and where um, that you actually did dig up the soil. So you want to map your property so you know where you're taking samples from. Sometimes they want to have more than one, just so maybe this part of your garden gets a lot of runoff from someplace, and so things are washing away. Maybe this other one part it piles up, and so that's going to be a different soil, or the mixture of um, the nutrients is going to be different. So they tell you then how to do the dig out the slice. That's that top right picture because <laughs> you just want a little bit. You don't want to dig up a big hole. Um, and then from that, you kind of see which areas work send it in your little packet that you've written down the date and what where the location is and then usually it's a very minimal fee they will charge you something to do the test um, but you'll usually send it quickly off to the lab and then they will send you your results back and if you don't know what you're looking at feel free to call the district we deal with soil tests all the time particularly for the agricultural um, folks we work with because we can read through the scientific language on there and tell you what is in that soil sample so then you know oh, I need to go get a fertilizer that has more nitrogen in it, or I need this. And that sometimes though, you don't even need a fertilizer per se. You can just change out the plants in your garden mm -hmm. because the plants will do that work for you. Um, nitrogen fixing they talk about and all that. So here's what you do for the test, but then afterwards call us and we can help you with what do you do next? Oh yes, and planning for weeds. I actually find um, weeding to be a very satisfying activity for me. And I think it's because I spend so much time online that when I can get out in the dirt and, you know, they talk about the microbes in soil actually giving you kind of a buzz or a high because um, they're good for you. But there's ways that you can make it so it's not so like it doesn't have to be all you're doing in your garden. Um, some of the examples I put on this slide, borage is in the top left. It is a non-weed. Um, the little purple flowers taste like cucumber. You can toss them on a salad. Bees love them and they spread. No, I mean, <laughs> you need to have room, but they're very easy to pick out. Um, they kind of have a life cycle and they'll go away, but that can keep other weeds you don't want out. Um, bottom left again, mulch, chips, um, get chip drop. You can get a whole bunch of stuff delivered to your house more than you probably need. So pay attention. Um, but it's a nice way to keep uh, weeds down just to put the woody material on top. 
bottom right is um, the Oregon stone crop. And I know it's going to be at the plant sale this year, but ground covers like that will actually be nice as well. They spread, um, so have some room for them, but then you can, they keep out the weeds you don't want. And the upper left, we talk about weed fabric. Weed fabric is both a blessing and a curse. Um, in many respects, it's really good, especially if you're gonna be creating those pathways we showed you earlier on in the presentation, because it'll keep some of that stuff down after you've done your flattening and everything. But sometimes in beds, plants and weeds and grasses have a way of just getting through anything over time. And then it becomes like you're fighting <laughs> the fabric um, for the space. And so be very cautious where you use the weed fabric. Um, and if anything, don't use the plastic stuff. <laughs> that stuff is awful because um, it just really gets into everything and it breaks down over time and becomes more of trouble than I think it's worth. But if you can, you know, actual maintenance and mechanical ways that you can pull out the weeds or trying to plant to um, keep weeds out is the best option. Yeah, and we're close to wrapping up. Um, as Kari said, plant in the winter. The right is me standing unsafely on a chair, climbing into my truck, soaking wet. Um, this is an excellent time to plant. So what happens is if you plant now, as Kari said, you're getting free water out of the sky. We're getting it today. And then your plants grow really big, healthy roots before they're having to support the top of the plant, right? So if you plant like during the summer and you've got leaves up there, they're trying to take in sunlight, they're getting hit by wind, blah, blah, blah. So this is not happening during the winter time. They're dormant for the most part, except for evergreens and the roots will get a chance to really grow. Our agency, when we're replanting, we plant in the, the winter months and we plant small, trying to get big plants and keep them going, especially if you plant them late in the spring. It is so much water and so much work and so high risk. And if you get an event like our heat dome this summer, anything that you just planted is at serious risk at that point. So planting in the winter and letting those roots get prepared, that way the top of the plant is going to come out much more lush. You're going to have much more support of the plant for taking up water and nutrients. Um, we will, in the soils class, we'll be talking to you about compost and mulch throughout. It's great for you know, it, filtering out water. It's great for protecting your plants and giving you rich organic soil. It's actually, if you can get it thick enough, great for keeping weeds down or in the case of creeping buttercup, which we all have and hate. Um, when they gr it grows in mulch, it's really easy to pull out in thick mulch versus compacted ground, okay? You'll wanna keep weeds down even if you plant in the winter. Um, if you do it early, this is again a correct it early. Um, you can kind of keep them at bay. What you will find, which is really nice for controlling weeds, the reason ground covers and shrubs work well is they start to shade out other weeds, right? So things like creeping buttercup hate the shade. And I can see where I start to get more and more shade as my the plants I want grow up, it starts to move further and further out in areas. So it's kind of its, um, you know, kryptonite is that they, they can't take that shade. Um, so we're in planting time now. Um, the conservation district plant sales all start in the winter. You can get bare root plants at those. And we have more classes coming. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Thank you so much for your attention. This was a lot of detail, but take it bite size and it will work for you. Wow. Thank you, Monica and Kari for um, delivering this amazing presentation, giving people so much wonderful information um, to get started on their yard. And yes, thank you all for watching. Um, and I hope you do have enough information and now confidence to get out into your yard and start the work. Um, if you're excited to learn even more about sustainable yard care, um, be sure to check out the other classes we're offering this winter. Um, I have the, the series here listed on the slide with all the different topics. And um, we have the links to register again in the description below the video. Um, if you're watching this, you know, past the winter time and these classes are over, we will also put up the links in the description for the recordings of these classes. Um, so. 
In addition, Monica and Kari have compiled a list of really useful resources, which they've been um, referring to in this talk um, to help you get started on your yard. And you'll also find these in the description below. Um, and finally, if you want to visit us on the web, um, you can click on the logos you see on the screen to find out even more information. So um, thank you all for watching and hope to see you at a future class. Take care.